from Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And ahead today, the first of a two-part discussion with K-State's Dan O'Brien, talking about the supply and demand factors that are contributing to the current volatility in the grain markets. Today, Dan focuses on corn and grain sorghum and offers some thoughts on how you growers might approach your marketing in the midst of these sharp price swings. Following then, K-State's Jeff Whitworth. Jeff talking about aphid infestations in winter wheat. Jeff cautions you producers to think twice before including an aphid-controlling insecticide with any fungicide treatments you might be applying. And on this week's horticulture segment, K-State's Cassie Homan will talk about homegrown herb gardening. All this and more right here on Agriculture Today. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State research and extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans and more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu. You are tuned in to the Thursday edition of Agriculture Today. Welcome once more. Well, the story in agriculture, the wild ride we see in the grain markets day by day, so much so that today, as well as tomorrow, we're going to devote time to the grain market trends and taking that proverbial deep dive into what's happening today into the feed grains. Joining us once more, Dan O'Brien, grain market economist, K-State Research and Extension. You marvel seemingly each day, Dan, at what's going on in these trades, but extraordinarily strong prices in corn and grain sorghum. Yes, the broader picture has to do with almost apparently insatiable demand out of China. You really see it on the grain sorghum side, literally 90 8% of the shipments of grain sorghum that have come out of the United States have gone to China. On the corn side, of course, we've had strong pace, strong demand. The USDA had actually raised that export projection in the last uh, USDA WASDA report. There's been some talk that we may not reach that that aggressive run up. Uh, I think it's at 2.65 billion bushels now as their projection. So anyway, you got that strong demand, and it's happening at the same time that the second crop out of Brazil, they call the safrina crop, has come under great stress. So when we we saw the markets going great guns, bananas, whatever descriptive term we want to use in the last several days, it was this combination of strong demand out of China on the one hand and the other primary major supplier in the world for corn exports, uh, that being uh, Brazil, having production problems, reports coming out of the field that they're getting chopped back tangible percentages in terms of their expected crop size uh, on a weekly basis. So it's an important thing. We've seen pictures from there, dry conditions, extremely dry areas there. And there have been problems in Argentina, another major exporter as well. So we have a combination weather market. And it's it's not our weather, it's South American weather and, and a demand pull market. And then with, with all that's coming into play in, uh, in China. Yeah. Since we're focusing on the feed grains, I think you have to go back and uh, look at these usage industries and see what these high prices have done to them. And, you know, are are they causing cutbacks in in, uh, terms of corn use? And when you look at that domestic demand bucket, to put it that way, Dan, particularly ethanol, there's a sliver of, you say, profitability starting to show in that enterprise. And that bodes well, obviously, for the corn and sorghum trades. Yes. Talking with uh, people in the media and other people in industry, they ask, well, when's, when's rationing going to happen? Well, it's no doubt happening in, in some of these. But the, the key of whether we have rationing or not, it has to do with whether the product prices, you know, the, the, the livestock being fed, the ethanol being sold, does the product demand drive the price of what's being sold up to match? Well, it seems in the last month for ethanol that uh, if you look on a weekly basis, we've seen ethanol well, we've seen corn prices climb for sure. Uh, in Iowa, up started about five fifty or so at the beginning of April, up to about six fifteen now. With that, gosh, the ethanol plants—you know—how can they possibly make money? 
But at, at the same time, you've also seen, and particularly in the last two, three weeks, the price of ethanol jump, uh, jumped 20 cents from the 16th of April up to 215 per gallon. And that with DDG's holding steady, they've dropped off some in terms of selling prices from where they were, but at least holding steady. For the month, on average, you, know, you put all those weeks together, those four weeks together, well, it looks like we're losing about seven cents a gallon, which, by the way, is better than 10 to 20. We, we've been losing for months and months. But you look at the last week, the week of the 23rd, with uh, you know $2.15 uh, uh, ethanol in that part of the country, even with 615 corn, you know, they're showing that they're uh, making profits by a couple cents per gallon. So interesting. So that, that means that the selling price of 215 for ethanol, that their cost of production is about 213. That's not a cheap cost of production, but that's also not a cheap ethanol price either. You say, though, that we are seeing here in Kansas demand for corn for ethanol output, not necessarily for grain sorghum, though. And that's being reflected in local basis here and there. Well, yes. You know, one thing that I've been watching is that, well, for the whole marketing or we, uh, anybody growing grain sorghum in Kansas is pretty optimistic about the export side. And we've had pretty good exports. But here of late, in the last bit of time, you've seen uh, some moderation in that export demand pull. I, it's interesting to me that that moderation has happened at the same time when uh, about two weeks ago, we had 33 million bushel of grain sorghum exported, which is I don't think we can say it's a record, but you know, most of the time we're trying to get two, three, four, five, and a good a good week is ten. Well, we had thirty three. So what a, what a week! Followed that up the next week with ten, and since then I've got back down to that that four or five area, sometimes lower. That, so the average pace we need to get to the end of the year is about four and a half to five, as I recall by my own calculations. But anyway, so after that. Uh, that run up, you know, the first thought was, well, we're going tremendous. This this is a start. But then immediately after that, uh, almost in lockstep, then the ethanol basis around the state started to really suffer. And and by not just a few cents per gallon, as I look look at the charts we pulled together here out of out of Ag Manager and and some information we've got in a special report on, online there, it looks like you know, well in parts of of western kansas uh, we've seen about a dollar weaker basis for grain sorghum central kansas i uh, went from about dollar 50 over to about 20 under so even wider so it's interesting that it seems like the areas where we uh, had the most decline were the well they were the export oriented ones uh, not quite as much decline relatively speaking in the uh, western third of the state where we could still feed livestock and Really, the star of the state is down there in the southeast corner. You know, we, we try to follow bids out of Columbus. Basis bids there have hardly weakened at all. Corn basis, actually, it has uh, been leveled to stronger here. N- not tremendously stronger, but by a few cents held up well in every part of the state except in Topeka, where, where it only fell off by a couple cents. So corn basis held up really well. And, and in so many words, the corn price... Has held up. The sorghum price has, you know, on a basis level, has weakened a little bit. So basically, sorghum has come back down to corn. And so, if that's the case, then from as for me, I, I kind of look to see when we start to see a, a grain sorghum bid at the ethanol plants. And so far, we haven't been seeing, at least with what's publicly reported. But if uh, corn continues to go strong and great guns, and if we see just so-so sorghum exports, then along with it looks like the likelihood of feeding a fair amount of wheat, we could see uh, sorghum start to come in too, and, and still be a tremendous price, $6 and some per bushel. But I think these high prices, that, that that's what's happened. It's pushed us into a, a set of dynamic, hardball comparisons uh, on, on what crops we can use to still accomplish whatever we're trying to get done. If you're a livestock feeder uh, or a uh, exporter uh, sending the livestock feeders, users overseas, or, or even ethanol people probably considering what to do. These high corn prices have forced us to consider a number of other alternatives that uh, outside of the normal realm of what we, what we would feel comfortable doing. As we round out this segment, and then you'll rejoin us tomorrow, corn and grain sorghum producers, once more, you see these day-by-day shifts in the market, uh, some volatile, some a little more tranquil, shall we say. Knowing how to maximize what's going on out there as a producer from a 
marketing standpoint, well, <laughs> it's hard to point to one or two or three definitive recommendations here, isn't it, Dan? Well, yes. And, uh, you know, you can build scenarios in your mind as to how we could use options, ag options in a, in a volatile time to, to position ourselves to take advantage of this. The challenge right now is that there's so much volatility that the price of all those options are so so heightened because they're reflecting all this uncertainty that, that gosh, the time to have done all this on, on the options was to have been a complete contrarian <laughs> and bought a bunch of cheap things for about five cents back in January, February. And so now I think the thing, if we're buying puts to protect the downside, we're probably looking at something out of the money, tangibly below where futures are at. If you have these corn closed yesterday at 546 and a half, then do we look at $5? Do we look at at 480. So much depends on our point of reference. If our point of reference is cost production and a, a profitability goal of 5, 10%, something like that, then we can, we can hit our point of reference. If our point of reference is the high we just had in the market, we're going to be torturing ourselves for, for a good long time <laughs> because that, that's such a moving target. So I, I, would, I guess I'd encourage people to think in terms of financial performance-oriented points of reference and, and goals on the marketing rather than what just happened, you know, uh, in, in terms of the high we just hit. And if we take that view, there, there seem to be some great opportunities out there for us to tie in five, 10 percent profits, things like that. And uh, so I, I guess I'd encourage us to take that financial view more, more so than just the pragmatic point of trade, what happened yesterday, how, how I can top the market. Very well. Well, we purposely did not address the soybean nor the wheat markets, Dan, because that's on tomorrow's plate as we'll dig more into these markets, what's going on and what producers need to be attuned to fully. So until we visit this same time tomorrow, many thanks. Thanks, Eric. Take care. Once again, he is a grain market economist, K-State Research and Extension, based in northwest Kansas. That's Dan O'Brien with us here on Agriculture Today. Legal and financial concerns surround the day-to-day management of the agricultural industry. Producers, ag creditors, and USDA agencies rely on Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. If you've received an adverse decision from the USDA or have an ag credit concern, call today, 800-321-3276, or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. Exploring options. Generating solutions. Welcome back to Agriculture Today, and more word on insect management now for you wheat and alfalfa growers, as our guest has again been out and about in Kansas, scouting fields for various insect pests. Jeff Whitworth is back by, crop entomologist with K-State Research and Extension. Well, Jeff, our wheat stands now are progressing right along to the heading stage. You say that aphid problems may be afoot out there. Uh, Good morning. Yes, I have been out and about the last four or five days. I did not note that much damage from insects or diseases or anything else, but I have gotten several calls about aphids in wheat, and this is the time of the year when aphids can affect wheat if they're around, mainly in the southern part of the state. The aphids, actually, they migrate in uh, on the winds when they're out of the south every year, and the first migrants, generally speaking, are the bird cherry oat aphids that come into the wheat. Now, we do have a smattering of green bugs also. There's some of those out there. But that's pretty much all I have found for the last week, and that's all I've gotten any calls about are bird cherry oat aphids and green bugs. And they actually carry about the same kind of populations. They all may carry or vector the disease that we commonly call barley yellow dwarf, the virus. But generally, we attribute the virus to the bird chariot aphid because there's usually more of them. And they're usually here a little bit earlier in the spring than the green bugs, but either can. Give us some background then on the, well, both, but particularly the bird cherry oat aphid and its tendencies out there. Well, the bird cherry oat aphid, they're here. They've been coming in probably for the last two or three weeks on the southern breezes. They can be here in the fall. They can be here in the summer. But primarily when they affect the wheat is now, in the spring. 
early spring, clear up until heading. Um, most of the wheat I've looked at in the last week or two at least is in the joining or a little further along. So it's, it's moving along really well. Again, the aphids are still coming in, so you got to keep that in mind. They're still, as you're out in the field, you'll still see them land on your coat or your shirt or whatever it is. So keep in mind they're still coming in. But I was really surprised at the lack of aphids that I found throughout the central part of the state compared to the calls I've been getting about mm-hmm. aphid populations in the southern part of the state. The aphids themselves will feed on the plants. They suck the juice out of the plants. Whether it's a green bug or a bird chariot aphid, they do the same kind of feeding. Generally speaking, the feeding itself is not enough to cause economic damage or to reduce yields unless growing conditions are not good. If, if, if the plant's under stress due to growing conditions and they get a pretty good population of aphids, it can cause you know economic losses. But so far, from what I've seen, we have really good growing conditions. The aphids that are out there, they are starting to establish colony. If you, if you go out and look in the fields, one of the easiest ways in years past I've found colonies of aphids is to look for beneficials. Green lacewings or lady beetles, uh, generally they will find those colonies first as they do sugarcane aphids and sorghum later in the year, but they're really good at finding them. So you start looking at the leaves, you find the aphids, Generally, you'll find the winged aphids first. Those are the ones that colonize or or immigrate in. Those are females because all the aphids reproduce parthenogenically or without the benefit of a male. They all produce female nymphs, and those nymphs, when they're produced, they can go from just birthing date until they're reproducing themselves in about 20 days. 14 to 21 days, depending upon the temperature, they can start reproducing themselves. So that's why aphid colonies or aphid populations can just explode so quickly. Now, all every aphid in the field does not necessarily vector barley yellow dwarf virus, but some of them do. And in, in Kansas, we've determined that the bird chariot aphids is the most common vector of the viruses that cause barley yellow dwarfs. So that's why we were concerned. It's not the aphid feeding itself so much as the potential that the disease may cause. How does one determine the need for treatment then, since we're in that gray area of whether the disease could be vectored? Very good question. In the last few days, there's been considerable interest in spraying for rust or for diseases. And I always get the call if I'm going to have my field sprayed for a disease or a pathogen, should I just add in a little insecticide because the cost of the application is already there, so there's no additional cost for application, and that will take care of any aphids, right, or any other insect pests that may be out there. That's true. It will. But we do not recommend that vociferously, very, I mean, I did not find one field that was even close to a treatment threshold. Treatment threshold for aphids generally is 20 plus aphids per tiller between jointing and heading or the stages that the wheat's in now or coming into in the next week or two. That's a considerable number of aphids. Remember, per tiller, 20 plus aphids per tiller with no beneficials. No lady beetles, no green lacewings, or no mummies. Uh, because if you have any of those beneficials, they do a pretty good job of controlling aphids. They're, they're pretty, this time of year, they're pretty voraciously feeding on the, on the aphids, and they will control them. If you spray, if you spray for a fungicide and you put an insecticide in with it, it will kill all the beneficials. Yeah, it will kill the aphids, But that insecticide is only going to last 7 to 14 days. Remember what I said when we started? The aphids are still coming in, and they're going to continue to get on the wheat. And as soon as that insecticide uh, has degraded enough so it's not effective, or the plants put on a little more tissue, a few more leaves or something that haven't been treated, those aphids are going to be just fine, and they're going to start feeding. Like I said, it's not the aphid feeding so much as if they do happen to vector barley yellow dwarf virus. This time of year, 
the virus doesn't affect the plant as much as it does when they come in in the fall. Mm -hmm. But still, we get some symptoms like turns the plant red or some streaks in yellow and red in the plant, and everybody gets excited about it. But do not utilize an insecticide with a fungicide and make sure you go out and you monitor your field, you sample your field, and you have at least 20 aphids per tiller, and that's field-wide or at least in the majority of the field. Uh, And once you get to the point where there are that many aphids per tiller and the plants are starting to look uh, like they're losing some vigor, uh, then maybe it might be worth spraying for the aphids. But generally speaking, in Kansas, spraying aphids for barley yellow dwarf is not the way to control barley yellow dwarf. But that's not what most growers think. And some of the people that sell chemicals will also tell you, hey, one of the good ways to control barley yellow dwarf is to spray the aphids. The aphids do carry it. The aphids have to be there to vector the virus. But that's not the way we control it because it only takes one aphid feeding on one plant to pass the disease along. And the next aphid a week later, two weeks later, can pick it up and move it along. So that's... Right now, I have not, at least throughout central Kansas, I've not seen a field that would justify treating with an insecticide just for aphids or adding an insecticide to a fungicide uh, just because you're spraying your field for uh, a fungal pathogen. A little management conscientiousness is very much in order here with respect to aphids in wheat. And let's squeeze in a word about alfalfa weevils which you're also tracking. You've been sharing information on that all through the spring. What's the latest there, Jeff? Yes, we've talked about alfalfa weevils and pea aphids in alfalfa. All of the applications that I've seen with insecticides for alfalfa weevils seem to work really well two to three weeks ago. Now, the, all of the, the uh, weevil larvae that I have uh, sampled in the last, this week, are mature. And they're just about through feeding Again, maybe another two or three days. The only field that I found any weevils at all were fields that were not treated. One of them was an organic field that wasn't going to be treated, but the uh, populations were mostly on the ground where they're pre pupae or pupae, which means most of the feeding is done. This year we've had good growing conditions. Most of the alfalfa has outgrown the damage from the alfalfa weevils. So from what I've seen, at least in the central part of the state, um, alfalfa weevil this year, and it's a univoltine uh, insect. It means only happens once a year. Uh, most of the larval feeding is just about done. So don't worry about control at this point. From all the fields I saw, at least in central Kansas, and from the reports I've gotten, the alfalfa weevils pretty much are done feeding for this year. That's good news to end on. Jeff, thanks for coming over. Keep us posted. We'll talk again. My pleasure. Thank you, Eric. He does stop by regularly to fill us in on insect pressure that's turning up in our field crops. Jeff Whitworth, crop entomologist with K-State Research and Extension. Now these moments away, we'll return then with today's agricultural news headlines and much more for you here on the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. Did you know every Kansas farmer feeds 128 plus people? Kansas farmers are hard workers, dependable, authentic, and sensitive. Not only do farmers put food on your table, but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car. For more information about Kansas farmers, visit K-State Research and Extension online or stop by your local Extension office. This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. Welcome back to the Thursday edition of Agriculture Today from the campus of Kansas State University. Eric Atkinson here. On we go now to today's agricultural news headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. 
Well, addressing this hot-button issue of taxes on farm estates and the plan to eliminate the stepped-up basis, the USDA issued a statement before President Biden's address to Congress last evening, the department stating that Biden's tax plan would have special protections for farms. The USDA stated it defers any tax liability on family farms as long as the family farm remains family-owned and operated. No tax would be due if the farm stayed in the family, says the USDA, and they went on to say no one should have to sell a family farm they inherit to pay taxes, and the president's tax reform guarantees that, again, according to the USDA statement. That was countered by the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, which criticized the move to eliminate stepped-up basis, arguing it that it would lead to the conversion of farms and ranches into urbanized uses. Under Biden's plan, about 2% of farm estates would owe taxes on their non-farm assets, and 98% of farms would not owe any taxes provided the farm stays in the family, according to how the plan reads. Agricultural interests on the front lines of charting a climate course for farmers and ranchers say there may never be another time like the present to expand conservation and other carbon sequestration programs. Panelists speaking to reporters during the North American Agricultural Journalist Conference yesterday noted that the Growing Climate Solutions Act was reintroduced in the Senate last week and it is drawing bipartisan support. The bill would create a certification program at the USDA to provide technical assistance for farmers to enroll in a carbon credit market. House Agriculture Committee Chairman David Scott of Georgia said on Tuesday he would like to move the act through the committee but lacks support from House Ag Committee Ranking Member Glenn Thompson. Now, Randy Russell, representing the Food and Ag Climate Alliance, said yesterday that he's optimistic that the act could be completed this year. Though work on a 2023 farm bill could provide some opportunity to expand conservation and other programs to address climate, says Russell. He added it was likely not going to happen in that farm bill process. Russell said any legislation will need to be bipartisan and the implementation of any new programs would have to involve all stakeholders to make it successful. Last week, agriculture virtually was left out of the Biden administration's two and a quarter trillion dollar infrastructure proposal. The former a policy director for the National Sustainable Ag Coalition, Fred Hefner, said this is why other ongoing legislative efforts present a good opportunity. He said, and quoting him, we shouldn't be looking as the agricultural community as if this was the farm bill. I think there's multiple bills out there that point the way to becoming a roadmap for what we need, in Hefner's words. He said the organizations he represents are most encouraged by the Agricultural Resilience Act. That bill would expand funding for agriculture agricultural research, soil health, nutrient management, farmland preservation, pasture-based livestock management, on-farm renewable energy, and food waste management. The USDA secretary is now talking with many of his international counterparts on the subject of climate change. More on that from the USDA's Gary Crawford. Climate change, of course, has become a major issue, not just with the U.S. and other economic superpowers, but with almost every nation. And on that subject... I can tell you that I've called a a lot more ag ministers and commissioners around the world in the first 60 days I've been on this job than I may have done in the first six months or year the first time I had this job. Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack telling reporters that by contacting and working with as many countries as possible... We can form alliances and groups uh, of nations that are like-minded on the issue of climate uh, to make sure that we go into a variety of international forums that will be held this year, having a strong position, uh, a position that supports science-based rulemaking, a position that uh, supports the the role of innovation in science uh, in meeting the challenges of food production and, and climate change. Bill Sachs says the U.S. is going to be a major participant in the U.N.'s big climate change meeting this coming November in Scotland. Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Next up for you on Agriculture Today, this week's edition of the Kansas Soybean Update. And as always, awaiting with that is Greg Akagi. Greg? 
Mike Steenhook, Executive Director of the Soy Transportation Coalition, joins us. And Mike, with all the talk about infrastructure and transportation, can you discuss some of the innovations that we have been seeing with regards to rural bridges and also repairs? Well, the Soy Transportation Coalition recently unveiled a, a report called the Top 20 Innovations for Rural Bridge Replacement and Repair. And it really is just kind of an effort to replace and repair some of these rural bridges with a significant cost savings without compromising safety. And, you know, our our argument is we can't just spend our way out of this problem. We also need to save our way out of this problem. So there's a lot of opportunities to repair and replace some of these rural bridges and make the taxpayer dollars stretch further in the process. So we would just encourage people to look at our website and find that report. Mike, there's also been a lot of talk concerning railroads recently as well. Yeah, there's two competing bids for the Kansas the City Southern from the, the two Canadian railroads that have significant trackage in the United States, the, the Canadian Pacific and the Canadian National. And obviously, it's a pretty kind of seismic event in the, the large freight rail industry right now. And both are aggressive competitors against each other, and they're both trying to acquire the Kansas City Southern. Hey, I would say there's a lot of details that we need to review and monitor as this discussion proceeds. Given the fact that Canadian National is such a larger railroad than Canadian Canadian Pacific, I do see more alarm bells and red flags being raised about the prospect of Canadian National acquiring the Kansas City Southern versus the Canadian Pacific. But clearly a lot of further information that's required. We'll continue to monitor this as it progresses. And Mike, you monitor other transportation news as well for the soybean producer out there. Uh, What do they need updated on? The administration and Congress are talking about an infrastructure package and President Biden submitted his kind of opening bid and the Republicans just have lately provided a counter uh, bid was more focused exclusively on transportation infrastructure and other things like the electric grid and water treatment. So it'll be interesting to see how this discussion proceeds. The president's proposal is much more comprehensive and extends beyond what we would call traditional infrastructure. So our ultimate hope is something gets produced that really is going to improve each of these links in the soybean and agriculture supply chain. That's going to be our commitment and our focus moving forward. That is Mike Steenhook, Executive Director of the Soy Transportation Coalition, who joins us on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. Thanks, Greg. Greg Akagi there. Well, another of those great K-State Garden Hour webinars is coming up over the noon hour next Wednesday, and we'll get into what it's going to cover next on Agriculture Today. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State research and extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans and more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu. Next up on Agriculture Today, our weekly horticulture segment. And to remind you, every other week we are keeping you fully informed on this series that K-State Horticulture is conducting a webinar series. And it's proven highly popular with folks. And another edition is coming up this coming Wednesday, May the 5th. It's the K-State Garden Hour by title. And the topic of choice this next go-round, herbs from seed to seasoning. This will be a two-layered presentation, and one of those who will be putting it on is with us now from the Post Rock Extension District. She's the horticulturist there, Cassie Holman. And Cassie, you'll be joined by your colleague Ashley Sfati to talk about herbs and, and how to use them. But your side of this is primarily on growing herbs. What kind of herbs are we talking about here for practical garden productivity? Yeah, that's correct. So... Herbs are just a great plant because you can use them in many ways. They're beautiful in the landscape, but then you can also eat them and smell them and cook with them. Um, and we're going to be covering kind of a, a wide range of herbs and, and things that grow well in Kansas and in our hot July summers and also things that you can put into your recipes. So throw some examples out of those herbs that do well in our sometimes temperamental conditions. <laughs> sure. Um, one of my favorites is basil. It does really well in the heat, and it's it's also beautiful. There's purple-colored basil, so it doesn't have to be just a 
plant that we're harvesting, but also something that's beautiful ornamentally in our landscape. Lots of others. We'll talk about dill, cilantro, oregano, lavender. And there's lots of herbs we can grow in Kansas. Some folks have tried herb production at home before and some have not. Uh, so how does one get started? What are the basic necessities here? Sure. And that's one thing I really like about growing herbs is that it's pretty easy. It's not like growing a big tomato plant. Um, it's great for beginners. So you can start them from seeds or from transplants that you buy at a greenhouse. And then kind of my top tip for growing herbs would be that they need quite a bit of sunlight. So there's a few exceptions, but most herbs will do best in about six to eight hours of sunlight. And then they don't want to be overly watered. So they need a well-drained soil. They're kind of, um, most of them are tender plants that, that don't like to have wet roots. So something where they'll drain well, not a heavy clay soil. So one can use their outdoor gardening area fairly handily for most of these herbs? Yeah, absolutely. And um, they do well in pots and containers. I like to have a a nice container kind of um, right outside the kitchen where you can easily go and snip them off um, to use in your recipes. What about other uh, fundamentals such as fertilization of herbs? Is there anything to that? So that's one of the reasons why they are so easy. They don't require a lot of fertilizer. Since they're not producing big fruits or, you know, things like that, not like a tomato that needs a lot of fertilizer to put on fruits, we harvest a lot of herbs just for the leaves. So they they do well in in pretty minimal um, fertilized soil. Will these herbs reproduce throughout the growing season? In other words, can you harvest them repeatedly during any given season? Yes, absolutely. They will keep growing. You can cut them and come again once they start growing again, and they're the perfect plant for season-long harvest. Are they prone to pest problems, much as our vegetables would be, diseases or insects? No, so that's another reason why they're great for for beginners. They really don't get many insects and rarely any diseases, so it's a great plant to start with. This really is a breeze, it sounds, Cassie, <laughs> raising one's own herbs. Are there any pitfalls that folks should know about? Um, so it's it's basically about just giving them a lot of sun because they create essential oils. So that's why we're harvesting the herbs to get those oils, to get that nice flavor and smell. So they just need, a, need to get the optimum amount of sunlight and then harvesting them at the optimum time to, to grab all those essential oils for our recipes or just to have a nice smelling um, sample in our home. You mentioned some of the standard types that folks gravitate to. Are there other types that folks might experiment with that might work in our climate? Sure. I think it's fun to experiment with herbs using them in the landscape, not just in the vegetable garden. So like I said before, they're, they're really beautiful. Lavender, rosemary, A lot of herbs have really pretty flowers that are great, you know, right in the front of your home. You don't have to to hide them in the back with your tomatoes. So I think that's a a fun way to experiment with them is um, putting them kind of out front in containers or just right along in your your landscape bed. About the webinar coming up where you'll be fielding questions from folks about herb gardening and your colleague, again, Ashley Sfati, is going to share some uh, thoughts as well about using those herbs in dishes and such. Is that correct? Yes. Ashley is our food and nutrition agent, and she'll be joining us to talk about some um, yummy recipes that you can incorporate herbs into. And it's really great to do that because then you don't have to use as much salt to flavor things. And so it's it's healthier for us to use those flavorings um, from the herbs. And you're looking forward to fielding questions because this, again, may be a phase of gardening that folks haven't really had much experience with in the past. So that's part and parcel of this webinar to take those questions. Yes, yes. We try to leave a little bit of time there at the end to do a Q&A session. And um, we found that we, we do get lots of questions and we have all the, the horticulture agents on the webinar helping to field those questions. So again, remind folks how they can take part in the K-State Garden Hour series, and in particular, your presentation coming up this next Wednesday. Sure. So we have a great um, Facebook page and a hashtag K-State Garden Hour. 
So you can find it on the Facebook page or on the horticulture information site. There's a garden hour tab there where you can register. Um, and when you register, it will sign you up for um, this webinar and the future webinars. So they'll always be coming to your inbox and, and you won't forget about them. <laughs> And there are a whole bunch more webinars coming up sprinkled throughout the rest of the spring and well into the summer and fall every other Wednesday or so. We're encouraging folks to take full advantage of these great learning opportunities. Again, the next one is set for this coming Wednesday, May the 5th, over the noon hour, of course. And the topic will be herbs from seed to seasoning. Cassie, the best of luck with the presentation. Thanks for sharing the preview of it for us today. Thank you so much. Cassie Holman with us. Cassie is the horticultural agent for the Post Rock Extension District in north central Kansas. Again, go to the K-State Horticulture website for more on the K-State Garden Hour and to register or check them out on their Facebook page. Our time's away once again. Thanks for listening in. Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.